Our next speaker tonight, Peggy Henley Magnatis. She is the associate director here at the museum. Good to get a little estrogen up here. She's a newcomer to Muskegon, about eight years. Of course, around here, and if you're not fourth generation, we're all newcomers. We love her, her at the museum. She's just made so many positive uh, impressions as well as upgrades and changes here. We're happy to have her students. This person can help you with your education. You really should be seeking help at this museum and any other than Monday nights. She's going to talk tonight about the U.S. Coast Guard and how the Cutter McLean had a role with the Coast Guard in World War II. So join me in welcoming Peggy Henny Magnatis. Okay, as they're finding this for me, thank you. Um, tonight we're going to talk about the second ship here on site. We have two ships of permanently moored status. One is obviously known as the USS Silversides. Our second one is not as well known. And it's the USS McLean. My question for you now, is it to the west or is it to the east? <laughs> Thank you for all of you that know that it's to the east. She is right over here, at least it's daylight out and you can take a quick peek at her. She has a wonderful story. She's led a long and glorious life and has many different careers that aren't really associated with what you think. You know, you think, oh, she's a Coast Guard cutter. All she's ever done is rescue people, which if you watch some of those Coast Guard movies, they're very, very impressive. But she's done a lot of other things that are very, very exciting. Okay, the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter McLean, 146. Isn't she absolutely a beautiful ship? Next time you're taking a walk down the channel, take a moment and stop, take a look at her. And once you hear about her wonderful past, you'll be so impressed. The McLean was commissioned April 8, 1927. She was built in Camden, New Jersey, and um, she was built by the American Brown Bovine Electric Company. Isn't she just look majestic sitting there in the harbor waiting to go? She was in service for over 41 years, which is an incredible life expectancy for any vessel. She's named after the 10th Secretary of the Navy, Lewis McLean. She's 125 feet long. She's capable of 13 point, was capable of 13.9 knots an hour, which is about 15 miles. And she's not moving too far, too fast on her own power these days, but we still have hopes for her. She carried a crew of three officers and 17 men. And she was really quite a powerful ship for her time. It's the 1920s. World War I is over. The nation is at peace. The country's policy right now, the foreign policy, is isolationism. Why would the federal government spend $63,173 to spend her? And now, you look at that and you think, it's so tiny. There's a reason for that. Because you think, it doesn't seem like a whole heck of a lot of money. Right now, in our current times, it would be over three, three quarters of a million dollars, $750,000 to build her. Why? The country's at peace. We're isolationists. We don't want any of this stuff going on around us. Why in the world would we possibly want to spend that kind of money? Okay. The average teacher at this time makes $18.65 a week, $975 a year. That hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> a laborer makes under a dollar an hour. It's an incredible amount of money. Why did we bother spending it on her? Yes? For a revenue cutter. For a revenue cutter. In other words, prohibition. Okay. The first thing that we have in January of 1920, the 18th Amendment is enacted, and it prohibits the sale or distribution of alcohol within the United States. And if this is the case, how did the time period get the nickname the Roaring Twenties? <laughs> you know, we're at peace. There's no alcohol. 
Everyone is good, law-abiding citizens. Nothing is going on. It's really, really boring. Well, I don't know if any of you have seen any of those movies out there that talk about the time period, but they have these things called speakeasies, which are really just any place where you can illegally obtain alcohol. And from what I can tell, there was 30,000 of them just in New York City alone. So there's just a little bit of place out there to get, just a tad bit of this stuff. So with these speakeasies, you get gangsters. And if you think that the gang problems we have today are bad, the gang problems back then were even worse. It was not a very safe place to be. There was lots of violence, and there was really no way to stem it. Just take a look at all the movies out there, The Untouchables. You'll get a flair for what's going on. We've got the 18th Amendment. The 18th Amendment says, no alcohol, except, of course, for medicinal purposes. Yeah. So if you could manage to get a script, you could legally go out and buy your own liquor. But if you didn't have your script, no such luck. So the rest of the people went out and they had to get their own from alternative sources. Now, the alternative sources were a little bit illegal. So the Coast Guard was given the task of interdicting the flow of demon rum into America. There was no mincing words here. It wasn't the municipal stuff that they're talking about not bringing in, it's that demon stuff that they're not talking about bringing in. You can't have it. And the Coast Guard at this point in the 1920s, because it is peacetime, there is no threat against our national, national borders, the Coast Guard is not very built up. It's using older ships, slower technology, and of course, what do you think the people that are trying to illegally bring the alcohol into the country have? Slaster, better boats. So, in 1923, they decided they needed to upgrade. And that's when the initial idea of bringing in new, faster ships that could keep track and go after the boats that were bringing in the illegal rum. By the time that the, our Coast Guard cutter is built in 1927, the Coast Guard has caught up a little bit and they've started a different policy. No longer are they going to continue to go after the small ships that are going in. They're going to start to go after the mother ships. The mother ships are large ocean-going vessels that are parked just outside of the coastal waters in international waters. So they act like large floating liquor stores, wholesalers. You take your small boat and you go up and you can track, go and do your business right outside in the international waters. It's perfectly legal to have alcohol in the legal international waters, they would actually have cruises that would leave out of New York City or any of the coastal areas, just go right outside of our waters, and then they'd start drinking as soon as they hit international waters. So it was something that we had to do. We had something that we had to keep up, something that we had to continue. So the funniest thing was, though, so her She's become a rum runner. She's out there chasing. She's out there collecting on these motherships. She's keeping those big ships out of water, prohibiting her from doing the business, um, them to do the business and to sell a liquor. She also then has another interesting task. A lot of these smaller ships that are coming back into American waters are getting caught. And instead of wanting to get their boats taken, they're either jumping ship or they're shutting their ships on fire. Well, just think about it. You've got all this fuel to get out there. Then on top of it, you've got all this liquor. What do you think happens to the boat? Very quickly. So the main mission of the Coast Guard gets into business there again, and they have to do rescues of the people that they're trying to arrest <laughs> for bringing in. So there's many very, very interesting stories here of how she has to rescue those people before she can arrest them. In 1933, prohibition is repealed. They've decided it's a failure, it's not really working, and 
our girl goes back to doing the normal things that a Coast Guard cutter would do. She's protecting our waters. She is doing search and rescue. She's keeping those buoys along so that everyone can have proper navigation. And she's doing ice breaking. And she's enjoying it. Life is very good. Life is easy for at this point in time. Unfortunately, Executive Order 8929 is issued on November 1st, 1941. And it brings our girl into the Navy. And all Coast Guard and Coats are brought into the Navy and they're continuing to do what they normally do. They are now under the control of the Navy. They are still doing the coast watching. They are still tending buoys. They are still ice breaking. They are still doing search and rescue. But as war becomes more and more imminent, things are going to change. If you take a look on the map, she's going to be sent off to the coast of Alaska. And that is where her patrol areas are going to be. And she pretty much does everything normally up until that point. Eventually, when war becomes more and more imminent, she is assigned to get depth charges and three-inch guns put back on her deck. They had been taken off long after Prohibition because there was really no use for them. So now that they're back there and they're put back on again. Okay. If you take a look over here, as long as I don't trip over it, this is the depth charge. We brought her up from downstairs. In a submarine museum, you do have a few anti submarine things, and this is one of them. And this is somewhat similar to what she would have had on her in 1942. The one that she would have had on her in 1942 would not have been the tear shape that we have up here. Feel free to come up afterwards. It's not going to be the tear shape, it's going to look more like a garbage can. And they would be put on to roll off the back of the cutter in order if case they saw a submarine in the area, and then they could. So they were planning that this was going to be a possibility. It did happen. In 1942, on July 7th, a Royal Canadian Airline noticed that there was a submarine off the coast of Alaska. They reported it. It was confirmed again two days later by some fishermen who had seen the periscope. So the Coast Guard cutter, our McLean, is sent out with another ship, the YP-256, and they're doing a search. They're doing a grid of a six mile area. They hear, while doing this grid, the distinctive noises of a submarine. They know they found her. So they immediately get into mode and they drop the first depth charge set for 250 feet. And they continue going. They set another one for 250 feet. And they see air bubbles, they hear the explosion, but nothing really happens. They know they're close. They can hear her. While the um, captain of the boat is Mr. Burns, Lieutenant Burns, is there, he's watching out, deciding while the two ships are repositioning themselves to have another strike, he sees a torpedo coming directly towards the McLean. It misses them, if you want to use that get smart, by that much. It's actually two feet, he says, that it misses the McLean by. He immediately heads off in a direction of where that torpedo has come from. In pursuit, they drop additional um, depth charges. They know that they cannot fight a sub on water. The only way that they can potentially keep themselves safe and take out the sub, they're no match for the guns that are on a submarine. They know they have to keep it below water. If that sub comes up, her firepower is going to be much more so than what they can do, and the McLean and all of her crew are goners. So they keep dropping depth charges, and eventually they start seeing an oil slick and air bubbles. And what they think was mattress material. They're not really sure exactly what it is. They spend the next day and a half in the area going over that same grid of an area, keeping track to make sure that no submarine comes up, that there's nothing there left to destroy. And they are awarded the only Coast Guard cutter in the United States to have ever sunk a submarine. Now there's a little question about that later on when they were comparing records 
And of course the Japanese said, nope. That sub went on to fight additional days, but the Coast Guard has agreed and she has received her awards for being the only Coast Guard cutter to actually sink a submarine. She has received during her time the American Defense Service Medal, the American Area Campaign, the Asiatic Pacific Medal, World War II Victory, and a National Defense. If you take a look up here after the class, you'll see what she came to us wearing. Oh, thank you, Kurt. What she came to us wearing. These are her ribbons that are proudly displayed on the side of her. We've since replaced them with, you know, newer ones, and she'll be getting even brand new ones, looking a little nicer as come the spring and once it thaws out. If you take a minute before you go, you're going to look up here, and you're going to see a wonderful picture of her that was painted during when she was towed down to Coast Guard Festival several years ago. We hope at some point to be able to get her back down there. This was brought to us just last summer. After the McLean continued her service and did many more rescues, search and rescues, and there's one specifically talking about how she rescued the people that were on a plane that had crashed off the coast of Alaska, which is all information for another day. She was turned sold in 1968 to a group in Chicago. Their intent was to change her into a training school for sea cadets. And so she spent from 1969 up until roughly 1990 being a training vessel for all these people in Chicago. Isn't it kind of neat to think they may have been moored very close to each other even back then? So they may have been neighbors. I don't know exactly where she was moored, but um, they could have been neighbors when they were there. And then in 1993, she came up here to Muskegon and she became our museum ship, giving her history and her wonderful information to future general generations. She is currently the only surviving cutter of her class. There are no other ones like her left in the world. And so she is a very, very wonderful addition to our museum. When you take a minute to come up, you'll see one of the, some of the books that we have on her, all of her paperwork up here, the newspaper articles all talking about when she sank the sub, all of her search and rescue missions, all the way up until the late 1960s when she was in active duty. You see the wheel that was just brought to us last summer by some sea cadets in Chicago. They came all the way over on another ship. They'd replaced ours and gotten another one. They came over and they visited the museum. And when they came, they brought us her wheel that was sitting in their offices. They also brought us some of the original navigation equipment that they had when they acquired her from the Navy in 1969. So we have a lot of interesting artifacts up there. So she's a pretty cool thing. So I recommend that you take a few minutes and you walk completely down the channel and say, wow, that's really cool. It's so easy to walk right past her and just say, another ship moored here. No big deal, but it is. She's the only one that sunk a submarine. <laughs> Peggy, thank you very much for filling us in on something that's right in front of us, maybe we haven't taken a good look at. You talked about donations and how this was brought to us. What is the museum policy? Are they open to donations like that? What's a good donation? What's a bad donation? Can you talk a little bit about donations, please. There is no such thing as a bad donation. <laughs> we are willing to look at anything that you have that might be of interest to the museum. We primarily collect World War II things. And what we intend to do with them when we get them is eventually put them on display. It's impossible to always put them on display. But don't hesitate. If you find something unique or different or you're just cleaning out someone's house, don't hesitate to ask if you think it's of some kind of value, even if you don't think it's of value. Think for a minute and say, a newspaper from 1940. You may say, it, oh, it's just a piece of garbage that's ready to be taken out and to recycle. No, take a look at it. There's not many of those original copies left. And we can keep it here, and we can keep track of it, and we can preserve it, and we can show it to future generations. Because not every edition of every newspaper from that era was kept. If you have someone's service medals, 
and you're like, well, I really don't know what to do with these, you know, think about donating them because then you can show a whole new generation that doesn't know any of these things. If you look at some of the artifacts we have up here, you think someone could easily have taken this and sold it for the brass. Somebody could easily have taken so many of the things and say, we'll just chuck it. Then you've lost a piece of history that's never able to be replaced. So definitely, if you have anything, give us a call. We're always open. If it's not something that we can use, we have relationships with other museums, and we can see if another museum will be more inclined to use that, pro that item that you have. Thank you. Sure. And again, thank you for Peggy for presenting. Sure. The Yanks are coming. Chronologically, we've been a little bit stymied this semester. We've had to take a little uh, circuitous route through history, and partly because of never-ending snow cancellations, partly because we've had speakers have been available at certain times. Last week, John McGarry gave us a wonderful discussion of the D-Day invasion. The Yanks are coming. Was success the only option for D-Day? We talk about leadership. There's so many definitions of leadership, but I think Eisenhower here so much embodies the idea of authority equates to responsibility. We talk about success, yet General Dwight D. Eisenhower had a plan in case of failure. We're often told, well, don't plan to fail. Well, nobody plans to fail, but certainly Eisenhower, understanding that responsibility was all his. He had a plan, if indeed there was failure. And the plan was really the idea that this was my responsibility. So perhaps before Harry Truman, stopped the buck on his desk. Eisenhower, indeed, the buck stopped there. But we didn't fail, and certainly we learned that last week. So we climbed up the Normandy beaches. And then what? Getting to the beaches was a tremendous accomplishment, but that was not the goal. The goal was ultimately Berlin. So getting onto the beaches was a great accomplishment, but we had to move past it, and thus the strategy was moving past the beaches through France to Berlin. And France, in many ways, was a challenge. We look at Paris. Paris was occupied by the Germans, and yet that was south of a direct line to Berlin. And thus, liberating France, uh, Paris was not necessarily a requirement. It was not an objective. But as we know, military objectives do not always coincide with political objectives. And ultimately, Paris would be liberated. And the Allied troops would march triumphantly through Paris, liberating them. And as we can see, this is about nine, ten weeks after the D-Day invasion. But when you look at it on a map, it's slightly south, not at all on a straight line to Berlin. And this, again, represents that mixture of political and military objectives. French General Charles de Gaulle, the idea that the duty of war, all men who are here and all those who hear us in France, knows it demands national unity. So it's not just that our country was unified. Indeed, France had a national unity, which is easier said than done, under occupation. So we look at the first stage of post-Normandy, and while we were successful in penetrating the Atlantic Wall, now we had to secure it. You did not want to move past Normandy and ultimately lose your rear in the, in the future. So when we look at Normandy, the goal of getting to Berlin was always the number one goal, yet securing this Atlantic Wall and liberating Paris was part of this. But then on to Berlin. It was a temporary detour, but the ultimate goal to Berlin to end the war. The Germans were in full retreat. After the breach of the seemingly impregnable Atlantic Wall, the Germans were in full retreat, and it was not really, by this time, we're probably not if, but very much when Berlin is reached. And what's causing this full retreat? Why are the Germans so weak at this time? Well, we actually learned it from Professor David Stahill several weeks ago with 
the Russians beating back the German invasion. And by now, by December of 1944, it is really the Russians coming one way, the Americans coming the other. And Germany is rapidly shrinking with the prize being Berlin. But the Battle of the Bulge would take place, and this would often be referred to as Adolf Hitler's last chance. And indeed, it was a gamble. It was a very good last chance. Ever optimistic Fuhrer, I've made a momentous decision. I shall go on the offensive. And thus, this piercing or this fighting against the Americans was the final trump card to regain the advantage. It was a strategy, a darn good strategy. Confidence was never at a loss for the Fuhrer. We shall smash the Americans completely, and then we shall see what happens. Yeah, you were War II vets. He's talking to you. I do not believe in the long run the enemy was able to resist the 45 German divisions. And in many ways, this shows a difference from what Ron spoke of just recently, Admiral Yamamoto, who was very aware of the American resolve to fight and the ability and had it been a very realistic opinion of the American resolution. As for Adolf Hitler, a little bit overconfident, somewhat of that early victor's disease, which maybe was appropriate in 1940, certainly not by late 1944. We shall yet master fate. <laughs> we shall find out. Why did the Germans attack? What was the purpose of this attack at the American lines? And more than anything, it was opportunity. We had gone through France, which slowed us down. Again, the quicker route would have been come off the beaches in uh, Normandy right for Berlin. It slowed us down. We've got this sort of a, of a battle with General Patton and General Montgomery. Who should take the big pierce through the German lines to Berlin? And ultimately, Eisenhower would say, no, we're going to move as a united front. We're not going to take one particular army and pierce them through. And thus, we could not maintain troops throughout the entire front, basically covering the former German-French uh, line. What were realities for Germany as they were planning this? Well... They'd had success in the Ardennes recently. 1870, there had been success in World War I, as well as World War II. This had been a region that Germany had successfully defeated their enemies. Probably more than that was the idea that the Eastern Front was hopelessly lost. By December of 1944, there is no chance of defeating uh, Joseph Stalin and the Russians. And they realized that there was a big Russian push coming, aimed at crushing Germany. And thus, this was a last desperate gamble to go on the offensive. So what was the plan? To pierce through the Allied lines, actually drive all the way to Antwerp, up in the lowlands, cut off the Allied supply lines, our supplies, by and large, were coming in from Britain. Split the U.S. and uh, British forces and have them sue for peace. When that is accomplished, then you're free to turn back around and allocate all of your troops on the Russian front. So this was their objective. And they had many advantages. Logistical lines, just as they'd suffered three years previously in Russia with long logistical lines, now that Germany is so compressed, they've got very short lines, a very tight concentration of forces. They're no longer defending an entire front. And they had surprise. Quite frankly, the Americans were not ready for a big a uh, fear push that was not ready for this counterattack. This never-ending belief in German superiority, the Aryan master race. Germans had been dropped and, and snuck in behind American lines to create uh, confusion. 
Germans who spoke English, and thus uh, we, many Germans would be quizzed, many uh, soldiers would be quizzed. Who's the president? Who's, who are the Cubs? Who do they play for? Who, what city are they from? And these Germans were very good at getting into American lines. So they had advantages, they truly did. When you look at the uh, remaining assets, Adolf Hitler had 200,000 troops in reserve. 1,000 tanks, 1,600 pieces of artillery. All of this was going to be concentrated in a relatively short, small area. And they had reinforcements. This was the last gamble. This is what they had left of their military. And they were going to use it in a very offensive measure. And thus we see the big December push. North to south, we're looking at about 65 miles. The total penetration, about 45 miles. And you can see the initial push of the German soldiers through the American lines were very successful. Perhaps victory would soon be theirs. Perhaps the Fuhrer show master fate. We were concerned. The Germans were sweeping past. We'll find out if Patton does anything on that southern flank. And thus the German drive would roll on. By now we've got other political concerns as well. As again, this U.S.-Russian race for Berlin ultimately means who's going to control post-war Germany. So this is very essential, and this was a very critical setback potentially for the Americans with this unanticipated push on the, on the, at the Battle of the Bulge. So we see the maximum uh, penetration. And again, looking up through the penetration mark, it's going to go up and to my right, to Antwerp, to cut these armies off. That was the German plan. The infamous surrender to General McAuliffe. When, issue, when, when uh, given an opportunity to surrender, Again, there's always a long answer. Perhaps the short answer was the most direct answer regarding his ability or his probability of surrendering. And it was indeed nuts. German had significant limitations with this as well. When you analyze it, which is always easy to do after the fact, as Ron talked about earlier, the problems with fuel and how fuel was so essential, the German military ran on tanks, and tanks required a lot of fuel, and they just were no longer getting this from their usual sources, particularly the loss of the Romanian oil fields. While they had several hundred thousand troops, these were young troops. These were the Hitler Youth Corps, completely inexperienced, and by this time in December of 1944, our American veterans were very, very battle-hardened uh, and young boy troops were just simply no match. Germany never fully developed their air cover as a means of their military strategy. We talked about that earlier in the class, uh, introducing the German military on the concept of Blitzkrieg, and the air cover was always looked at as a secondary, third dairy issue after the armor and the infantry. Of course, by this time, they had so little left of their air force. It just was unable to provide them the cover that was required. While the Fuhrer was very, very optimistic, his generals certainly were not. By this time, Germany has been at war really since 1938. And the war futility and while the generals on the ground knew exactly what their probability of success were, was. And there's just nothing left to replace. This was a last ditch effort. There's neither human nor physical material to replace these losses. So in many respects, it's in somewhat perhaps impressive that they made the push that they did. But in analysis afterwards, it was very much futile. We look at these Allied defenses, initially only 83,000 troops, so indeed they were far outnumbered and 242 tanks. But this ability to bring the, uh, reinforcements in, as we see eight days later, 600
100,000 troops were brought in. The Germans had 100,000 boy troops to be brought in. The artillery, the tanks, it just was way too overwhelming. And again, in many respects, the generals knew this, even if the Fuhrer refused to admit it. So battering the bulge, pushing back, you can see with generals Hodges, Montgomery, and Patton, they ineffectively have surrounded these German troops and have limited or stalled this incursion, and they're ready to push back, and push back they would. Help would be on the way. Eisenhower would order the counterattacks. And another infamous story asking General George Patton how long it would take him to turn his army. Seems simple, but turning an army, especially with 1944 technology and means, is nowhere near simple. Patton, having anticipated this, responded 48 hours and did it far sooner than that. And Patton was very much aware of the importance of turning and facing this German onslaught. Yeah, I think they were looking at that polar vortex that we've seen all winter. Because, uh, as they say, it was cold and damn cold. But fighting these type of conditions certainly cannot be good at all. I'm not sure what was in the rations. I'm just a wee bit young for this one. But uh, maybe steak and lobster. Who knows? Maybe not till they got to Berlin. Ultimately, the bulge would be repelled and pushed back within, a, well, within two to three weeks for sure. Six weeks, the complete bulge was in the lines was squashed flat, and indeed they were rejected, they were repelled. And now, more than ever, it is now the beginning of the end. Winning the war was effectively done. It was a matter of time and speed, and ultimately the race for Berlin. But the battle has a tremendous legacy. Again, 89,000 casualties. a tremendous number of casualties. And as you can see, we took more casualties than the British did. It was the bloodiest battle that the U.S. forces experienced. So it should not be marginalized, cast off, or even scoffed as unwinnable. It was a gamble, a huge gamble. And having just spent my last weekend in Las Vegas, I got back late last night, I know a lot about gambling. I didn't even, I had worse luck than the Fuhrer, so. What's the aftermath of the Battle of the Bulge? Well, again, it's over. The German reserves are gone. The Luftwaffe is shattered. There is no Air Force. And they would be retreating all the way back to Berlin, not if, but when, and virtually, virtually no resistance was given. Same time, we still took casualties along the way many casualties. But this Battle of the Bulge was a last-ditch attempt by the Fuhrer to generate success. It was the beginning of the end, and now it would be the race for Berlin. Okay, I want to wrap up with a couple of things. First of all, just rethinking our sponsor again tonight and keeping Sergeant Herschel Kidd in our memories. We appreciate our sponsors. Uh, there's still some opportunities. If you'd like to see Dr. Frank Marzak as a future sponsor, we, he very much would welcome that conversation. Other than that, thank you for participating. Thank you for making this a wonderful lecture series. And thanks to all of our speakers tonight. <laughs>